I want you to read the title of this video again and fully understand what I mean by it. This book was genuinely difficult to read. Kingdoms of Death is brutal and unrelenting in its treatment of its characters and what Christopher Rocchio is trying to set up. I did not enjoy the reading experience of Kingdoms of Death and it's absolutely brilliant. It takes a hell of an author to be willing to pin an entire book of misery and know that they can pull it off at the end so that the reader will not resent them for it. It won't be an utter decimation of the tone, the structure, the what have you of the series they've built so far, and instead can be a moment, a pivot, so to speak, that allows the series to go in so much deeper, so much more thought provoking of a direction. And that's what Kingdoms of Death really does accomplish. He's experienced about as much pain and suffering as anyone I've encountered. That being said, I won't say this is my favorite Sun Eater book. It's definitely probably my least favorite, but it's also possibly the one I respect the most. Let's get into it. So this is where so many of the themes that have been prevalent throughout Sun Eater of pain, existence, purpose, really come to the forefront and challenge you to be willing to stick around despite where those ideas can go, especially in the world building and not provide you any safe answers, not provide you any outs, not in directly the narrative, the events happening to the main character, or in how those ideas are talked about on the grand meta scale. I mean, in the previous books, we have seen that this is a world that has so many dark, twisted things happening to humanity, to alien life, to just existence as a whole, as the realization of the true causes of this wars are coming to the forefront. And Kingdoms of Death is possibly getting the award from me for most living up to a name I've ever come across. I'm not gonna lie, I read the title Kingdom of Death when I was uh, finished with Demon in White and I was like, ah, this might be a little bit overselling it. Nope. <laughs> the final note I took, keeping it spoiler free for this sir section, in my notes was just, Hadrian's life is a curse. But let's go ahead and get into why and talk about these spoiler-free events of this book. So the start of Kingdoms of Death follows kind of the Sun Eater formula where there's like a little bit of a Star Warsian kickoff action sequence, hurrah, before things turn and pivot. And I actually was being pretty harsh on this book uh, when I first got into it. The opening setup action sequences, it, it usually feels disjointed from the last book. This one even more so for some reason to me. And and then when that conflict began, the political play, action sequence, things build to, all felt like something that Sun Eater was better than. And even now that I finished the book, I think there are elements there at the beginning that could have been handled better. But in Sun Eater fashion, there is then a twist, a ha ha ha, I can't say in this part of the video. And that's when I realized this was going to be a very, very different reading experience than what I anticipated. And before you click off this video, if you're not interested in Sun Eater, let me just say my piece here. It's important to read books that challenge you. And I never expected the Sun Eater series to really be something that wanted to sit down across from me as a reader and challenge me and really try and pull from me thoughts around what it takes to heal, what it takes to grow beyond trauma, but that is largely what Kingdoms of Death is setting up. I don't even think it's about getting over it. It's just clearly setting up, destroying a character who must then come back from what is done to them. And I went from thinking, oh, this is kind of starting off a little too Star Warsian to me, to going, oh, Kingdoms of Death is Sun Eater going, okay, Sun Eater, but berserk. This is beyond Terry Goodkind levels of torture and pain and awfulness well beyond being inflicted on a protagonist, but it's with purpose and filled with allegory and meaning. I do want to admit though that there is throughout all of Sun Eater been kind of a clunkiness with starts that hasn't ever clicked into place with me. I kept thinking, okay, in the next book, I'll get used to the formula, but continually uh, the weakest part of every Sun Eater book is the first 20 to 30%. And if I had to guess why this series hasn't popped off more, I remember the start of Empire of Silence not being my absolute favorite. And I think quite a bit of people just kind of put it down and go, ah, whatever, this wasn't for me. And 
don't, if that was you, go back. <laughs> go back into and, and read on because this is ha. In terms of pacing impressively, despite how much tonally this just sinks into the shadow, Kingdoms of Death flies by. In a miserable way, I was just getting through these pages because there is this haze that permeates a large section of the book, this delirium that allows you, the reader, to kind of just flow through so much tragedy, so much of the depths of depravity of life itself. By the time you get to the end, you'll be shocked that you've managed to finish that much misery. And again, I don't think talking about this is too much of a spoiler because on the grand structure of the series, this book with its titling, its darker branding and everything, you can kind of see coming. This is going to be the low point that the rest of the series hopefully comes off from. I think that's being really signaled to the audience at wide. I mean, it is the cover where the enemy is taking the spotlight. This is the villain's book and I love that because if you've been following Sun Eater up to this point, Hadrian has felt very powerful, very much so like he's an unstoppable force. Here though, he meets his immovable object and the limitations of Hadrian's power are put on full display and exploited. And that's where the hatred that Rocchio wants to set up for the villain comes into play because we know from the opening page of the first Sun Eater book, Hadrian is the man responsible for eradicating the Cielos and winning the war against them. But we've been left wondering like, why? He was such an optimist. He he wanted to come to peace in some way with these people. All right, the war is getting worse. That question is answered here. And fortunately, this book provides us a view into the mind of the enemy, the true motivations for them. And I didn't even realize it, but I feel like Sun Eater was missing it now in hindsight. We've seen so much of the Empire's movement, so much of their motivation, so much of their flaws. Now, Kingdoms of Death has provided that for the enemy. And gloriously, in classic Rocchio fashion, while we are immersed in this education of the other side, Hadrian continues to have these profound moments where he's going through allegory, where there's so much reason behind his evolution, his sinking, and there's one specific conflict I won't give any details on where he's offered but this offer, we the reader know immediately, is loaded with all kinds of drawbacks. And this beautiful moment of character work from Rocchio not only proves who Hadrian is at his core, so deep down within him that no matter how much you break him, you cannot change these like few fundamental pieces of who he is, and shows why he's actually, even in defeat, even in loss, so fascinating to follow, so strong and genuinely great. Like thinking of the Hadrian at the end of this book compared to the one who started Empire of Silence is just like, Haha, that's how you evolve a character, good Lord. I wanna wrap up the spoiler free section with one fairly heavy criticism and one more piece of praise. The criticism is, Rocchio relies on some specific writing devices for Hadrian. Like he's constantly realizing he said something that feel more amateur than this story deserves. It's something I've seen a lot in self-pub books where people have someone holding their breath. It's stuff along those lines, right? There's the classic cliche example of, I didn't even realize I was holding my breath. Things like that that are laid into Hadrian where it's like, you've done this multiple times in recent chapters. Does he just have Tourette's at a certain point? Uh, but you know, it's, it's kind of minor, but I know for specific readers that will be a huge bother. And it did bother me good bit. But the last positive I'm going to say is calling back to my uh, earlier last note of Hadrian's life is a curse. The ending of this book, the last sixth of it, is the feeling of shock drawn out over a large period of time because the amount of a trauma inflicted on a person. And it's up there with the best I've read. Uh, Christopher Rocchio understands how to write someone who has been traumatized, how to write someone who is so walled up yet never more vulnerable. Despite me saying this book is miserable to read and I think intentionally so, it's also my favorite moment for Hadrian because Hadrian has been a leader I have been frustrated with in a believable way. He is a flawed man that I find so tantalizing to watch. He is destined for greatness, believably so, well, not being able to get over some human flaws that I myself have gotten over. But at the end of this book, I had the thought that I now fear Hadrian. Like, this is someone who has been pushed so far. He went from being this optimistic kid to now someone who embraces the empire, now someone who 
is uh, uh, surrounded by enemies, but doesn't seem to see the flaws in that because he is so driven towards just this one that he wants to take down where you're hearing him referring to the empire as home and things like that. And it's, ooh, ooh. I've never wanted to share a joint or a drink or whatever your vice is with Hadrian, but now I don't want to share a room with him. Uh, this this feels like an Alexander the Great who's holding on to sanity with his fingernails. I'm at a time in my life where I find myself really connecting to stories where people are healing, probably because I'm trying to go through a bunch of therapy and things in my own private life, that focus on men not hell-bent on revenge, but instead taking the time to try and find peace, to try and grow, try and heal. And there is the final chunk of this book. It's not about healing, but it's, it's about trying to overcome. It's not this focus you see so often where it's just like machine guns, action, and it's it's slowing down to realize that this is, yeah, a man, but it's also a person. And I really do appreciate that because, you know, there's, there's so many books out there that treat horrible things happening to men as something you can just flex and, and move beyond because strength. And like Berserk, Sun Eater's answer to that is just a flat out no. <laughs> if you get put through the grinder, that's going to change you and you need to work, not in revenge, not in some kind of action sense, but internally to try and come to terms with that, to try and grow beyond it and beautiful. Love that. And I really do appreciate that view on how men can need to heal as well. So my final rating for this, I'm so conflicted. Like my enjoyment is at an all time low for Sun Eater. And I don't even think Rakio would blame me for it. This is not a happy, enjoyable read. It's like at a five. Like there are so many things that I found myself pondering and, and, and really enjoying. On a technical level though, it's one of the highest of Sun Eater left. It's like at a nine. It's so intense and well thought out and purposeful. I think I'm gonna have to just settle on the nine cause I'm like, wow, but I, I'm gonna knock it down to like a light nine strong 8.5 because the number of people who I'm actually gonna be able to go up to and say like, you're gonna wanna read this is lower. It, it's the same audience as like a Berserk audience, which I know is gonna point some people's ears because they love that kind of story. They wanna be challenged as a reader. And Kingdoms of Death, it challenges you. It really does. And also if you just look into what has inspired Sun Eater, Rocky has talked about it on his channel, the more you look into those stories and then read this story, I really appreciate someone who's willing to unabashedly just kind of like pull from these great stories and weave them into their own text directly and indirectly. Uh, it, it's, it's really fun. It's playful. Playful. Yeah, Kingdoms of Death is playful. But, where's the mic? <laughs> But first, I want to give a big shout out to today's sponsor, Wraithmarked Creative. Wraithmarked Creative is best known for doing some absolutely incredible deluxe editions of community favorite books, including the likes of Legends and Lattes and Sword of Kaigen. Now, though, they are taking on their most ambitious project yet with an illustrated deluxe edition of B.E. Schwab's Shades of magic. Many of you already know Schwab. She's a best-selling author, the creator behind, of course, Shades of Magic and the smash hit Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which was a personal favorite of mine when it came out. Great book. And now she is working directly with Wraithmark Creative for a deluxe edition of the first book in the Shades of Magic series, A Darker Shade of Magic, which is live on Kickstarter right now. This book looks absolutely incredible, even well before going into production. Rovina Kai is dropping the cover of the book, as well as the fully wrapped illustration of the hardcover case. The dust jacket is additionally going to be embossed and foiled with matching metal gilding on the page edges and included ribbon bookmark, which I guess you can use a ribbon bookmark if you're one of those heathens who doesn't just fold the corner. The inside is going to blow your minds too with incredible full color in sheets from the legendary Felix Ortiz. I've ordered them directly. Felix, 
one of the best in the game, as well as a ton of interior illustrations and even more to be potentially unlocked with the ever so enticing stretchy goals. Best of all, Schwab is signing each and every single copy as someone who just did that for my own. <laughs> Good luck. So be sure to check the link in the description down below and support Wraithmark Creative's newest deluxe edition and support the channel here by, be by being sure. I'm gonna keep that take to use the link. So be sure to check out Wraithmark Creative's incredible campaign. Be sure to use the description of the link down below to support the channel here. And now back to today's video, you little goblins. Mooglins. But okay, let's go ahead and move on into the spoilers territory for Kingdoms of Death. Three, two, one. Giving you a little bit more time. Sorry, I didn't record the halfway reading point thing again. I know I didn't do that for the last book I reviewed. The reason I didn't do it for this one is if you've read Kingdoms of Death, there's not really a good halfway point to stop. And I kept going further and further in the book, expecting there to be like, okay, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen, something's gonna happen. I'm I'm like 90% done. And then something happened, and I was like, oh sh. <laughs> well, I might as well finish it. So uh, that's why I'd kind of read the whole thing. Uh, don't worry, the, the general review mentality from here on out is gonna be halfway through, stop, record, spoiler thoughts, then finish and do, uh, or spoiler free, then finish and do spoiler filled, but you know that. All right, I've given you enough time to click off the video if you don't want spoilers. Let's begin. Three, two, one, go. There's still like so many moments. This is a small thing. This is such a small thing. Hadrian's such a fucking hypocrite. And I love to hate this guy. Uh, Hadrian Marlowe, man, might be my favorite protagonist I've read in years. Also the protagonist I am most often like putting down the book and going, come on. You're a hypocrite. Like he's judging cloning so harshly. And at the end of this book, 90,000 of his own soldiers who are kept in like fugue are butchered and like dude you can't judge cloning when you are in an empire that keeps legions on ice i mean it, it falls right into like you know there's and i love that though right it makes sense the empire has these ideologies hadrian's been taught since growing up and like that's important to have you want to have these things these ideas in your character's mind that conflict you and that plays right into that conflict that offer of being cloned that Hadrian gets that I, I really love that moment. I think that is such an important moment for Hadrian um, and frankly for the series as a whole. If he had done that compromise, one, I don't think his abilities to survive would have gone with him. But on top of that, it, it was the moment, the sign for us that despite seven years of torture, seven years of the Cielsen working to break him, Hadrian wasn't broken because he thought it through, he realized that the trap was, and he avoided it. Perfectly Marlowe. He is the biggest stubborn jackass, which is exactly why he is the person to take down the Cielsen. There are parallels in his personality that make him more like the aliens than I think at this point, Hadrian would like to uh, recognize. In the past, he'd be thrilled to hear that. Now he'd be like, I realize Hadrian is broken when he gives up information, things along those lines, but that's being broken in a moment. He's never broken entirely as a person. There's a distinction there that I think the book recognizes. I just wanted to emphasize that I understand the difference. And quickly while I'm doing this cut in, I also wanna say, I feel like I didn't spoil the book because it sounds like, oh, he manages to escape, but he does at what cost? It's it's unreal that there is an escape attempt and he succeeds, but me, even as the reader, I'm like, this was a failure. Everybody died. And so I feel like if you watch the first half of this video, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, maybe there's like a happy ending. It's not at all. I wanna say, yes, there are problems I have with Kingdoms of Death. The whole setup to the highway fight at the beginning, the political intrigue was ang interesting and the betrayal angle, but the actual action I just found not as interesting. But what it led to, magnificent. And for every like sour beat I have like that, there is a beat that feels as thought provoking or heartbreaking as that cloning offer. I mean, the, the Valka uh, calling out her name and just, being in this fused, this horrible state of delirium, just so broken down, pour at my heart. Like Hadrian does feel above 
man. And he somehow still managed to continue to feel that way despite being forced to drink piss, left on a wall where they throw remnants of his people at him, failing his entire legion. 90,000 people brutalized, destroyed, torn apart, eaten by the Cielsen, and then Hadrian fails all of them. Hadrian is a failure. That is, like the people who think he's a Mary Sue, show me where. <laughs> Up until this point, there has been so many moments where it's just failed, failed, failed. Really good success. Failed, failed, failed. Really good success. And one of the best parts of this, this full commitment to decimation where we thought Sun Eater was going to be going. I mean, the half of the cast of characters you've been introduced to just gets murdered. Like his crew is gone. Like th this is a red wedding level of, oh, you thought you knew where this is going? Let's go, clean the plate, we're going in a new direction. But for the same reason why the Red Wedding worked in the Song of Ice and Fire, it works here, a new direction to go in, and it's not backing down. I don't think Rocky will back down from saying to the reader, the price was too high. Like this, this wasn't something where Hadrian comes out on top, it is a catastrophic defeat. Sorry for not spending too much time talking about the bulk of this book where it's just torture, but the really important beats for me happen afterward. But I do want to say that girth of the torture, it's going to be a turnoff for so many readers. Don't blame you. For the entire series though, it was the right call. I think I've heard like there was a book split here or something along those lines. This is really the setup for the next is, is what I've seen in the subreddits that I've got like really gone through without getting spoiled or anything. And uh, I can't wait to see where the momentum is going to springboard off from here because if we are sunk so low, that means we have so high to rise. And this Hadrian feels more dangerous, but he also feels more truly aware of what the threat is, what's going to happen. And this break at the end of the book where he spends additional years in solitude while Volca goes into Fugue, you see Rocchio not back down from Hadrian kind of losing his mind in isolation. Ouch, like there's such, what did, what did he do to you? Christopher Rocchio, what did Hadrian do to you? <laughs> because right when I thought seven years of torture was going to be the worst thing that happened to him, and it is, but we then get on top of that. The icing on the misery cake is he then has to sit in isolation floating through the void of space just with his experiences and thoughts. That sounds terrible, I don't wanna do that. The contrast though, once they arrive at the planet where they wanna see the descendants of, uh, S woman whose name I forget, sorry, bad, dumb, dyslexic brain, learning that Gibson is alive. It's like a starless sky suddenly being pierced by the arrival of the sun. And Hadrian at his ultimate low is given a branch that if it wasn't set up to be such a bad state, would feel a bit too much. Like Gibson still being alive if the last horrific section of the book hadn't happened, I would have been like, come on, really? But the fact that it did, I'm just like, thank God. <laughs> we have someone here who can provide some beauty and some light and Gibson does exactly what you need him to, exactly what you need him to do as the reader and what Hadrian needs him to do. And more directly than ever, Hadrian treats him as the father he is because Hadrian at this point is a broken, child. Like he's been reduced to a state where he's violent, he's he's lashing out at people, his temper's short, he's behaving like a child, which is a very common symptom of being deeply, deeply, deeply traumatized. And despite how in the grand scheme of the series, how not tiny, but little amount of page time Gibson has had, the vibrancy of his love for Hadrian it always shines, but it, it hits like a warm campfire in a winter storm, and I, I love it. And the final heartbreak where Gibson dies of old age and Hadrian buries him, actually tears. Like I was sitting in a coffee shop with Kayla and I had tears in my eyes because it's just so beautiful. And I, I know that if you haven't read it and you're still here, I understand sometimes it's fun to talk about spoilers if you haven't read the book, but it's not treated as another nail in Hadrian's sanity coffin. And instead it's a part of his healing because th this is an uncomfortable truth that I feel like Rocchio is hitting on. Yeah, death is horrible and tragic, but death of a life well lived, 
there's beauty in that. And that's kind of, in a very broad stroke sense, what Hadrian needed. And I think the book addresses that to an extent. Like, he gets to see someone who did live a long life, did get joy in their final years, because I think they spend nine years with Gibson after he wakes up. And despite losing the person who, who felt like a father to him, this is Hadrian I, not losing someone in a brutal, horrific way. He's actually able to say goodbye in a sense. He does cry. He does break down. It's all appropriate. But it's also surrounded by love. Gibson's death is immersed, sinking in love. Hadrian's love for him, Volca's new love for him, the town they're spending time in, you know, Hadrian's healing. And yeah, it could just be another tragedy. But to me, it's what reminds Hadrian about life's worth living. And life doesn't end just because trauma hits you. Um, that's, that's a beautiful beautiful message for this book to end on. After so much misery, it's absolutely in the same vein as Berserk for me, where it's like the worst the world has to offer can happen to you. But as long as you're willing to keep walking forward, as long as you don't give up, you're winning. Period. It's the sharp nerve pain of clearing a wound and then really being able to begin healing it. After so much infection, after so much festering, the wiping away the dead flesh, properly treating it, and giving it the time it needs. It's it's incredible. I, I, I am in awe. I, I love this so much, and it was horrible to read. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in to this latest episode of Book Reviews. I don't, I meant to, wow, okay, that's the ending we're going with. Like and subscribe if you have not already, and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. Ad rates are at an all-time low for my career, so we're, we're not tight. I'm fine. I want to make that very clear. But if you throw a dollar over at Patreon, it would mean so much and help us be uh, all the more flexible here with what we're working on, especially while I'm trying to buckle down and get started on that Fringe project. But, you know, all that good stuff. Love you. Book linked in the description down below if you want to check it out. All the Sun Eater books. And have a good one, y'all. Double hand peace sign.